Thank you, Monty, and thank you, Susan. Uh, what a remarkable evening and a remarkable event that you pulled together. Uh, lovely to meet Lizzie again, and you and the family, and uh, Jim and Cynthia and Stacy and Lee, who've made this happen, pulled the website together, and uh, really produced an extraordinary uh, aggregation of uh, love and enthusiasm and interest and hope. This is a remarkable uh, feat. And uh, I am deeply humbled by uh, what you've done and uh, uh, eternally grateful for the approach that, that you've taken tonight. I want to thank the members of the audience for, for being here, supporting the family, and for coming to hear about the, uh, the possibilities that lie ahead in the future. Those possibilities really are all about Katie and people like Katie. Uh, the mission is focused on patient care, everything we do everything we think about, the students we teach, the laboratory studies that we perform, uh, the patients that we take care of, all of that is an, an effort to improve patient care, to cure when we can, to care for uh, patients at all times, and for comfort of the patient and family uh, through the ordeals that those folks who have neurodegenerative diseases particularly are facing. But there's more to the story than comforting and caring. Those are the old time tried and true approaches to patient care and to medicine. But there has to be more than that. And so what I'd like to share with you, in a sense, is my own story as well, how we landed up here and where we've come in research, where we are now, where we think it's possible to go with the kind of help and support that uh, you all are all, all here tonight to think about. Um, I actually am happy to be back in Washington. I am a graduate of Walt Whitman High School, believe it or not. <laughs> I grew up in Durban, South Africa, as did my wife, Jenny, who's here tonight and uh, is also delighted to be part of this. Um, before I went to the University of Cape Town Medical School, I came as an American Field Service Scholar to Walt Whitman, loved it. It was a totally out-of-body experience for a boy from the bottom of Africa. And, um, from there, when I completed my medical school studies in Cape Town, came to Boston to join family, and I trained in neurology at the Boston City Hospital. And that's when the story began in terms of my own intellectual exercise. What was taught at that time by the major figures in neurology, including the, one of the major figures who taught the neurologists around the country who really influenced the future course of neurology in the 1950s and 60s, was Dr. Derek Denny Brown. Dr. Denny Brown had described the basal ganglia as being an important part of motor control. This is a set of nuclei, gray matter regions deep inside the brain. I saw some patients who had a stroke in the basal ganglia, and their problem was not motor control. It was one of higher order function. They actually had a lack of awareness of the left side of space, which we generally thought of as a problem that arises from the cerebral cortex. This led me to two questions and understandings. One was that one could understand that manifestation of this problem from the basal ganglia by looking at the anatomical connections. What is the relationship of that part of the brain that was damaged to the parts of the brain called the association areas, important for everything we do that is high level beyond sensation and beyond movement? And that's the road that we chose to study. I'll take you there in a minute. But what it also raised in my mind was the question, if this basal ganglia, which is not only motor control, as Dr. Denny Brown had so rightly shown, is also cognitive, what about the big machine downstairs, the cerebellum? Could that be non-motor as well? And so that was the spark of my question back in the early 1980s. Is there a role for cerebellum in cognitive processing? There was indeed a literature going back to the 1830s, almost a counterculture, like a little subversive view that cerebellum wasn't only involved in coordination of speech and eye movements and so on, but had a role to play in other kinds of functions. So uh, this is to show you where the cerebellum is. You turn the brain upside down and you see cerebellum, and in fact we are turning the brain upside down. And we're seeing this from an entirely new perspective as it will become apparent as we go. The road, the road that we chose was to look at brain connection. So there was a technique developed in the 1970s where you place a tracer in the brain, the bright white spot in the brain of a monkey, and these white streaks here are actual fiber cables that literally connect one part of the brain with another. They are highways in the brain that are very precisely organized and highly arranged. And they land up ending up in the part of the brain called the pons. And what that's important for 
is it's, there's a, a connection from the brain upstairs to the little, the little brain downstairs, which goes through this part called the pons. And we decided to study the parts of the upstairs brain that are important for thinking and planning and spatial awareness and language processing to see, do they in fact talk to cerebellum? And this is one slide just to show that after 10 to 15 years of work, you can put everything you did onto one slide. <laughs> <laughs> the green is motor kind of behaviors, and there are, in fact, green spots in the part of the brain stem that talks to cerebellum. But the other colors, as you can see, come from the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is important for planning, organizing our uh, behaviors, mm -hmm. attention, uh, paying attention to where we think things are going in the future, planning, and so on. The parietal cortex involved in spatial awareness, where things are in space, our relationship to the extrapersonal world and our own world as, as well. The language areas here in red, and then places involved in spatial memory. And all of these parts of the cerebral hemispheres project to the pons. And this is work that I did with my colleague and mentor, Dr. Deepak Pandya. Began working with him in the early 80s, and we still work together. Uh, a friend, mentor, and colleague through all these years. And all of the anatomy that I've done has been done in collaboration with him, one of those kind of relationships that you build and grow on and changes your life as you go forwards. Having shown that, though, and other investigators subsequently in demonstrating that the cerebellum talks back to the brain upstairs through other very innovative work through investigators in other parts of the country, the question then was, well, what does this mean? So you've shown us these pathways, so what? Well, the so what came from the role as a clinician as well as a scientist. And the way I like to, to share this kind of thinking with my students is that being a clinician and a scientist allows us to take the following strategy, that patients tell us the answers, we have to figure out the questions. So we go into the lab to try and find the questions to explain what the patients are showing us. This is a young woman who I met you know, almost 20 years ago now uh, who had a, a fall on the ice in Boston she was found to have a tumor on the CAT scan, and the tumor was taken out. This is the midline of the cerebellum. And she was brought to the attention of the medical personnel because of a marked change in her personality. In addition to the personality change, we went to the bedside, did some very simple tests to see how these high-level functions are working. And she had difficulty with uh, planning how to draw a clock. She had difficulty even uh, drawing a, a line through a, a horizontal line. And she had trouble writing a proper sentence. I am a young girl who is 23rd. This showed us the map of what could go wrong when the, a, a damage was inflicted on the cerebellum itself. We then found that in children who had tumors taken out, one could find a similar kind of problem. And this problem, this is a little fellow who had a tumor in the cerebellum that was resected, and there's some changes in the cerebellum thereafter. He was asked to copy a diagram, which is a fairly straightforward test of visual spatial function. He was poor in his copy had great difficulty in recalling it immediately thereafter. And the delayed recall a few minutes later shows this extraordinary fragmentation, almost like a loosening of association would be a term that psychiatrists would use in his, try and, in his attempt to replicate these findings. And what this led to was a notion of the cerebellar role in cognition summarized in our monograph in 1997 um, and leading to the syndrome that we called the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. So we now have the demonstration in people who have problems in the cerebellum that is not only motor control, but a complex range of high-level functional impairments that include difficulty with emotional modulation. And our theory was that in the same way that the cerebellum regulates motor control, so does it regulate intellectual processing, awareness of who we are in the world, emotional modulation. The implications of this, an idea that was just an interest and the curiosity and the scientific question back in the early 1980s has gone far beyond what I could have predicted. The implications include the need to know. This is a driving, pressing requirement of families and patients who have illnesses. From a disease like Katie had with SCA17, what is this? Or folks who've had a problem with the cerebellum, why is this? What happened to my family member? Or in some cases, what happened to me? It allows us to engage in new kinds of therapies, treatments of folks who have emotional and intellectual problems as a consequence of cerebellar trauma or cerebellar damage. It helps us to understand behaviors and psychiatric manifestations in children. And what this does is it merges neurological troubles and psychiatric troubles in one spot clearly. 
And because of the damage that happens to children that are too